Hello and welcome to this session of ACS Science Talks, Connecting the World Through Science. This is the virtual lecture series, Scientific Talks by Specialists on Specialized Topics for a Specialized Audience. I'm Aparna Sharma and I'm pleased to be your host for today's broadcast of ACS Science Talks. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Krishna Raghav Chaturvedi, who will be moderating today's live Q&A. Some announcements. This session will be recorded live and would be placed in the ACS Science Talks library. In case you face any technical difficulty, you can reach out to us in the chat box. ACS Science Talks are an interactive program and we would love to get you involved in this discussion. You can share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A panel. The moderator will take up these questions with the expert during the Q&A session. You can also use the chat to introduce yourself and say hi to our expert. Before we begin the session, a brief message from the American Chemical Society. Our efforts at ACS are guided by our vision and mission, which also determines our goals to provide information solutions that address global challenges and other issues facing the world scientific community. To empower our members by providing access to opportunities, resources, skill training, and network. To support excellence in education by fostering the development of innovative, relevant, and effective chemistry and chemistry-related education. To communicate chemistry's value to the public and to the policy makers. To embrace and advance inclusion in chemistry by promoting diversity, equity, inclusion, and respect, and creating a welcoming and supporting environment. So in its efforts, ACS provides a variety of resources. One of the flagship ACS resource is the ACS meetings. Just like ACS Science Talks is a platform by ACS to connect researchers, ACS meetings aims at unifying the scientific community. Every year, active researchers and professionals from across the globe came together to share ideas and advance the scientific and technical knowledge. ACS meetings are regularly attended by thousands of science professionals every year. As we mentioned about the goals and mission of ACS to support the global scientific enterprise, ACS has, ACS has taken the challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic and converted into it into an opportunity. ACS meetings have embraced the hybrid model, which is helping us to enhance the networking opportunities by combining in-person interactions with virtual networking platforms to promote inclusion and accessibility by removing geographical barriers, by enhancing representation, by reaching out to diverse range of presenters and attendees, providing flexibility and convenience by accommodating different preferences and circumstances, increasing engagement and interaction, to foster a dynamic and inclusive conference environment, provide continued knowledge sharing opportunities by ensuring continuity of knowledge sharing during unforeseen circumstances, promote sustainability and cost effectiveness by eliminating the need for travel and accommodation expenses and associated carbon footprint. To further the hybrid model and increase its effectiveness for our global audience, we are glad to introduce the Global Virtual Symposia. The Virtual Symposia will offer fully virtual programming covering various dedicated tracks in chemistry and allied fields. These symposia are developed in collaboration with the global ACS constituents, providing sessions in the daytime of different global regions like Asia, Pacific, Africa, Middle East, Australia, and Latin America. In the upcoming ACS Forum meeting in August 2024, the Global Virtual Symposia will feature five symposiums. The call for abstracts remain open till April 1st. So now our speaker for today is Professor Martin Blunt. Professor Blunt is currently a professor of law in porous media in the Department of Earth, Science and Engineering at Imperial College London. He joined Imperial in 1999. He served as a head of the Department of Earth, Science and Engineering from 2006 to 2011. Previous to this, he was an associate professor 
Professor of Petroleum Engineering at Stanford University. And before joining Stanford, he was a research reservoir engineering with BP in Sunbury on Thames in the UK. He holds MA and PhD degree in theoretical physics from Cambridge University. Professor Blunt was elected fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2019. Professor Blunt's work has helped transform our understanding of how fluids move underground. This research plays a vital role in our energy transition through the better design and management of carbon of hydrocarbon production and carbon dioxide storage. He is now extending the application of his work to study other porous materials, including those used in packed bed re reactors and catalysis. So thank you so much for joining us, Professor Blunt. The stage is all yours. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, and I'm delighted to the have the opportunity to share some of my research work today. So let me uh, let me start here. Here's the title, Flowing Porous Media in the Energy Transition. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the fantastic group of PhD students, postdocs, and other colleagues that I've had the great fortune to work with. This isn't a formal picture, um, but it's, it shows uh, many of us in the group actually celebrating the thesis defense of uh, the student there, uh, Luke Judici. So, uh, so the work I'm gonna present is obviously, uh, has actually been done by the people I'm acknowledging here on the slide. So, what are, is porous media, right? And how does it relate to the energy transition? So porous media are solid objects that have holes. Um, and then there is some fluid flow through those holes. I think you're all aware of that. Um, but they're ubiquitous, ubiquitous in both natural and manufactured settings, right? So soils, um, your lungs, plants are all examples of porous media as, as are, you know, cloths, uh, babies' nappies, and also in chemical engineering, say, pack bed reactors and catalysis, cat catalysts. Um, one of the main applications that I'm going to talk about is deep underground sedimentary rock um, is also porous. And that rock, generally speaking, contains brine, salty water at depth, but is also where you find oil and gas, and is also where in the energy transition, as I'm about to describe, you can store uh, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, or indeed a thermal energy heat. So here is an example of why we need to consider flow and porous media at the large scale, and specifically carbon dioxide storage. So at the moment in the world, we produce about 35 gigatons of CO2 a year, and that's from principally from burning uh, fossil fuels, oil, oil, gas, and coal. Now, as we transition towards net zero, we've got to do something about the CO2 emissions from the fossil fuels that we continue to burn. And so what we have here is how much CO2 we would have to collect and store underground rather than it going into the atmosphere as a function of time. And all of these scenarios involve a significant amount of CO2 storage. So while we want to phase out fossil fuels and while we want to increase renewables and do that at speed with urgency, the harsh reality is we will still be emitting CO2 and those emissions need to be collected and stored. And so you can see under various scenarios, by the middle of this century, we are collecting many, many gigatons of CO2. Uh, per year. And that creates an industry in terms of the volumes of fluids we're dealing with that is as large as the current oil and gas industry. And, and I think you can see, um, obviously, why there is an equivalence there. So talking about the, the oil and gas industry, this is recognised. So here is a statement from uh, the CEO of BP a few years ago, with a commitment to be net zero by 2050. And what that means is, not only in their own operations, they'll reduce CO2 emissions, but actually, what about the CO2 emissions of the oil and gas, you know, the company sells? And the idea here is that anything that they sell, the CO2 emissions associated with their products, there is an equivalent amount of CO2 that is stored. And the, the, the best way of doing that is to collect that CO2 and to put it deep underground in porous media. 
But the scale of the challenge is enormous. There are projects on CO2 storage worldwide. Um, ideas that this is somehow a speculative or premature technology is, is actually just rubbish. Um, uh, we do currently store about 30 to 40 megatons. So that's the problem. We're two or three orders of magnitude out in scale, but it doesn't mean to say that we can't do it. So here are just, uh, just a few examples. So Saudi Aramco is the world's largest oil producer, and they have plans for what looks like fairly significant amounts of CO2 storage, right? Up to nine uh, megatons. So that's that's a, that's a big, big increase, right? Um, but actually, if you look at the CO2 emissions associated with Saudi Arabian oil production, it's tiny, right? It's only one half of 1%. So it's nowhere near 100%, okay? Um, so, and then there are other projects what was going to be touted as the world's largest CO2 storage was the Gordon project to offshore Australia. Again, significant amounts of CO2 are, uh, are being stored, but it's actually less than half of what was planned. So there is a challenge there. And of course, that's why it's something that we need to look at um, seriously and try and address that challenge. But it's not just CO2 storage uh, that is necessary for the energy. Uh, transition. There's also energy storage. So as you as, as you may know, renewables are intermittent. So when it is windy or sunny, you're producing more energy than you need. And when you have dull uh, still days, um, but you need the energy, right, you need to have stored it for, for, for those periods. So global energy use, let, let's just put some numbers on the table, right, is about 20 terawatts. OK, and if you want to deal with uh, long term intermittency, you do need to look at, you know, hundreds of exajoules of, of energy storage, particularly for seasonal intermittency. So there are a number of ways in which you can do this. Um, you can store hot water. You can store compressed gas or you can use electrolysis to convert excess electricity into hydrogen. And then the hydrogen you can convert back in a fuel cell, or indeed you can burn the hydrogen directly. And again, that's uh, uh, that doesn't produce CO2. So 100 exajoules is an awful lot of water, right? We're now looking again at giga, gigatons, many gigatons. Compressed gas actually is not so efficient, right? Because that's a huge amount. Um, hydrogen is more efficient, but we're still looking at gigatons. So when we're looking at gigaton storage, you know, we can store things in tanks at the surface. Um, we can do all sorts of things. But at that scale, you really do have to consider porous media underground. That's, that, that's where you have that sort of capacity. So many of the main societal challenges for the 21st century involve flow in porous media. So talked about CO2 storage. Right, and dealing with our current CO2 emissions. I haven't mentioned groundwater use and protection, agriculture, all of that relies on fresh water. And where is that fresh water? Right, it's in soil. Okay, uh, geothermal energy as well, hot water underground and thermal energy storage, hydrogen storage. But then we have manufactured materials as well. So, what's shown here is electrochemical devices. So we have uh, an electrolyzer here in a fuel cell. An electrolyzer uses electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And you have to have the flow of water and the gases through a porous membrane. You have exactly the same in a fuel cell where you combine hydrogen and oxygen to create electricity. And again, there's transport of gas and liquids through a porous membrane. And then in the more sort of you know, chemical side, um, pack bed reactors, again, are porous media. Uh, catalysts are also porous at a, at a sort of nano, nanometer scale. But then some of the other things which I, which I haven't really looked at, talked about, where I said, well, you collect the CO2, well, you have to separate the CO2 from other gases, say, for instance, from the exhaust gas of a fossil fuel burning power station. How do you do that? Again, you can use porous membranes for that. So with that introduction, you might be saying, well, yeah, but what do you actually do at Imperial College? So what we do is we try and understand processes at the pore scale, um, at the micron scale. And the basis of this is, in fact, Im imaging. So we have porous media. Here we have a piece of porous rock, right, maybe between 5 and 15 millimetres in diameter. And then what we do is we use X-rays to image at the micron scale. Now, you're probably familiar with X, 
ray imaging. Here is a medical CT scanner. So you know, if you break a bone, it will image the bone. We can do that for large scales, but it doesn't give us the resolution we need to see the fundamental processes. However, there's a lot of problem with x-rays. You just need to put the sample close to the x-ray source. So we have a, what's called a micro CT scanner where we do this. And you notice here that the sample is wrapped in this gold jacket. What we can do is we can apply conditions of high temperature and pressure that we might encounter, for instance, deep underground. The problem with the micro CT scanner is it takes an hour or so, and sometimes several hours, to generate an image. So what that means is you're looking at a series of steady states. So if you want to look at dynamic processes, you need um, faster imaging. And for that, you need a brighter X-ray source. So at synchrotron sources, you do have a brighter X-ray source. So here it's ionizing the air. OK, there you're taking the image and we can get down now to one second time resolution. So it's like having X-ray spectacles, but better than that, because in fact, you're creating three dimensional images. So here is an example. Um, here is a piece of rock. Um, it's a couple of millimeters across. OK, and this is from an experiment where CO2 has been trapped in the pore space of the rock. So what this is doing is just uh, zooming through the imaging images and then we do fancy image processing. OK, so what these blobs here or ganglia are, that's CO2 trapped in the pore space of the rock. So this is a CO2 storage application. The different colors simply represent different discrete ganglia of CO2 that are surrounded by water in the pore space, so they can't flow. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in just on, on, on one of those blobs. And one of the things we're interested in is a wettability, and specifically contact angle, the angle at which the water and the CO2 meet the solid surface. So the carbon dioxide is shown there in the middle. OK, we've got the water in blue right, and the, uh, and the pores as well. So we're just running through this. And then what we do is we detect what we call the three phase contact loops. This is where the two fluid phases contact the solid. And then if we take a plane that is perpendicular to that three phase contact loop, right, as show, we'll just zoom around. We can then use that to measure the contact angle. And that gives us a measure of wettability. And I'm going to explain in a bit you know, why that's so important. So now we have a picture here. That's carbon dioxide. This is the solid rock. This is the water. Traditionally, actually, you measure carbon, uh, you measure contact angle through the uh, denser phase through the uh, water. So this will be a contact angle about 45 degrees. And what you notice is that the water, it's water wet. The water likes the surface. The water curves round here to coat the solid. The CO2, on the other hand, is in the non-wetting phase. It forms ball-shaped objects in the wide pores and does not like the surface so much. OK. So let's see what that implies for CO2 storage. So here's a picture where I've injected, we've injected supercritical CO2, so, so super, uh, CO2 at high temperatures and pressures like we did encounter underground for CO2 storage into a porous rock. And the blue shows the carbon dioxide that's connected across the rock. And of course, that's the concern because people say, well, you inject the CO2 underground and then it continues to move and it's, it's buoyant compared to the, the brine or the water in which it's stored, where it's injected. And so it's going to rise up and escape again. And that's completely pointless. Um, but that's not what happens. What happens is the carbon dioxide moves, it gets displaced by water. The water is the wetting phase and actually preferentially fills the narrow regions of the pore space. And what it does is it traps the carbon dioxide. So after migration, basically after replacement by water, what the different colors here show on the right is discrete ganglia of carbon dioxide surrounded by water. That CO2 can't move. It's trapped in the pore space. Um, it may slowly dissolve or react, but it's actually safely stored. So this is well known. This is how much is trapped, what fraction of the pore space um, contains trap phase against how much you have to begin with. And in this particular example, you have about 50% saturation to begin with, and you trap about a 35%. The remaining CO2, that doesn't inevitably escape. No, as that moves and migrates, that too can get trapped. So in fact, the principal reason why we think we can store CO2 in the subsurface is we put it underground. It either has low permeability rock that prevents it moving upwards. And if it does begin to move, then it gets trapped within the pore space of the rock. So now that gives you some idea. When we look at flow and porous media as a scientific discipline, what are we actually trying to design? And this is one of the things that we have tried to do as a group. 
traditionally we tend to think about a application like oil recovery or CO2 storage, and then we sort of add porous media as a bit of a sort of niche subject. You know, we sort of dip into it. What we're doing is actually we're looking at flowing porous media as a distinct scientific discipline and then applying it to lots of uh, different applications. So the things we really need to design is either we want something not to flow, okay? So examples here are um, CO2 storage, right? We don't want the CO2 to escape. And um, the other classic one that we're all familiar with now are surgical masks, right? Droplets of water, either from you or from someone else, you do not want to go through the mask, right? So you want to trap water. Um, the other thing you often want is the opposite, which is flow. You want two fluid flow phases to flow over a wide saturation range with actually little trapping or retention. So examples here um, were the fuel cells and electrolyzers where you had water um, and gas transport. Oil recovery, obviously, you want to get the oil out of the ground. Um, and hydrogen storage where you want to store the hydrogen, but of course you want to produce it again when needed, okay? So there's uh, some pictures of all the myriad examples, both natural and manufactured that we're interested in. Um, and this process is going to be controlled by the pore structure, but also the wettability, the contact angles. So what we perform are experiments and modeling at different scales. And we're just going, I'm just going to touch upon one aspect of this. So I'm going to do this with a little bit of a theoretical interlude. I'm going to introduce the concept of curvature. Now, I think um, everyone sort of knows what curvature is. If I draw a, a, a smooth curve like this, at any point, say, O, I can fit a circle. OK, and R is the radius of curvature and kappa, which is the curvature, is just the inverse of that. OK, um, in three dimensions, because we're interested in three dimensions, if we have a smooth surface, hopefully it's not conceptually a huge leap to um, accept that there are two curvatures, actually two principal radii of curvatures, curvature in orthogonal directions. OK, so the way of thinking about this is if we have uh, an apple or, or something that's ball shaped, OK, the, the, the ball bulges out into the air in two directions and have two, two radii of curvature that may be similar and they're both positive. But you can have something that's a pear shaped. Now think about that. If I slice the pear, it's a circle. OK, so the pear bulges out into the air. That's a positive radius of curvature. But the whole thing about being a pear shaped is this curvature okay in this curvature the air bulges into the pair okay and that actually is a negative radius of curvature don't get yourself hung up about how can a radius be negative it's going in the other direction so the curvature has another uh, the opposite side okay so um you might say well, well i'm very interesting but, but, but why okay so the first is where you have a meniscus between two fluid phases um, there is a pressure difference between them called a capillary pressure. And that is actually given by the young Laplace equation, which is simply the curvature times the interfacial tension. So that gives us the pressure difference between the phases, and that is in itself interesting. But you've got two curvatures. So if you've got two curvatures, they're sort of two independent things. OK. Um, and so there's a Gaussian curvature, which is the product of the two. And at this stage, OK, it's just a mathematical object. But it is known that you can have a complete characterization of geometry, basically for knowing what they call these four Minkowski functionals, which, which boil down to the saturation, how much of a phase do we have, the surface area between the phases, the curvature, and this Gaussian curvature. And the Gaussian curvature tells you something really rather important. It's a measure actually of connectivity. So is the Gauss-Bonnet theorem a remarkable theorem, it's called, because the integral of the Gaussian curvature over the surface of an object is a topological descriptor. So it's four pi times the Euler number. And what that means is if I've got a ball and I integrate over the surface, um, the integral of the Gaussian curvature is four pi. You might be able to see that, right? The, the, the area of a sphere is four pi r squared. The radius of curvature is one over r. The Gaussian curvature is one over r times one over r. So it's one over r squared. So you just get four pi. But the remarkable thing is, if I get this ball and I change its shape, right, bulge it out, make it as complex as I like, that integral is still full pi. Right? It only changes if I split it into two balls, in which case then it's eight pi. 
if I put a loop in it, um, then that integral is zero. If I put two loops into it, it's minus four pi. So you have this Euler characteristic, which is a topological measure, and it's actually um, an integer. And what that means is if the if we have a large positive value of the Euler characteristic, we've got lots of discrete objects, lots of balls. If we have a large negative value of the Euler characteristic, we have objects with lots and lots of loops, lots of connections, well connected. So that's where trapping and flow comes in. So trapping and flow, apples and pears, we actually already know what we need for trapping. But that's well known. We want one phase to be wetting like the surface. The non-wetting phase gets trapped in the larger pore spaces. In terms of this curvature, what this means is we have ball-shaped objects. Both radii of curvature are, roughly speaking, similar. The Gaussian curvature is positive. The integral of Gaussian curvature is a big positive number, lots of discrete trapped objects. So it's a sort of mathematical way of saying something obvious. What we need for flow, however, until recently, was a little bit more obscure. What's the opposite? Well, actually, what you want is you want pear-shaped menisci. You want equal and opposite curvatures. So you want to be curved in one direction, one way, and the other direction, the other way. Right? And um, turns out you see this in what are called uh, mixed wet media. So where you have a surface where one part of the surface is oil wet or hydrophobic, so repels water, and one part of the surface likes the water. And then you find that the menisci get pinned at the boundary between the two. And so you basically have these pinned contacts. And to minimize surface energy, you actually create surfaces which obey this criteria. So minimal surfaces, and here's some examples. A catenoid is shown on the, on the left. A catenoid, a catenary is basically the shape that a chain would, would have or a stream would have under gravity. A catenoid, you've rotated it. OK, um, and you'd see this if you have a soap bubble and you move it across in the way it described. OK, you can see that that's not a flat interface. It's curved, but equal and opposite curvature in orthogonal directions. OK, um, the helicoid, again, is a sort of twisting thing. And so you find these minimal surfaces where you have these pinned contacts. And what this implies is the phases on either side, you've got two fluid phases on either side of this meniscus, um, are well connected. OK, they have lots of loops. So do we see these minimal surfaces? And the answer is yes. So here we actually have oil and water in a rock. OK, so it's a sandstone. And uh, what we've shown here is the interface between the oil and water in a case where it's water wet. So the oil basically forms these blobs, uh, sort of spherical blobs in the wider pore spaces. And it's not that obvious from looking at the blue, but actually that is sort of bull shaped. And if you look at the curvature, the curvature is positive, right? That all checks out. If it's mixed wet, how do we make it mixed wet? Well, actually, if it's an oil reservoir, oil has migrated into the rock and has been sitting there for uh, millions of years. And surface active components in the crude oil basically stick to the surface. So where the oil has gone, you get an oily surface. And where the water is retained in the pore space is still water wet. So you have this mixed wet condition. And there you have these pin contacts. You see much larger surface area, much more complex interfaces. And the average curvature is almost exactly zero. OK. And when we first measured this, this is about four years ago, um, when we first did the experiment, we assumed as normal when you get something it looks wrong. And then we checked it again and it looked wrong. And we checked it a third time and it still was looking wrong. So we did another experiment and it got the same wrong answer and of course at this point we began to believe what we saw so you do see these minimal surfaces and they do indeed give you very good re recoveries so here is an example this is an oil field example so here is a carbonate this is the type of rock that you see in the middle east where where most of the world's conventional oil is contained okay so what we're doing here is we start off with a rock that contains a little bit of water and mainly oil that's shown in red. This is quotes the raw image. So, so an image that's sort of in the gray scale, but now I've put some colors in so you can actually see what's going on. And then we start injecting more water. So it's 15% water, 85% oil. And we go all the way until we're injecting just 100% water. And you can just see visually. This is remarkable. This is a complex rock containing crude oil and I inject water and I get most of the crude oil out. And the reason is that the phases stay well connected. 
So the capillary pressure, the pressure difference between the phases, is not exactly zero, it's not exactly a minimal surface, uh, but without dwelling on it, um, this is a very low capillary pressure, an extremely low capillary pressure, right? Much, much lower um, than you would normally um, expect. And what's shown here are the relative permeabilities. And for those of you not expert in this, I don't want to say too much about it, but a relative permeability is basically shows you, relatively speaking, how well the two phases flow. And what you see is that both phases will flow over a very wide saturation range. And basically, essentially what's happening is the water is not that, is, doesn't conduct that well, okay? So the water gets held back in the pore space and the oil can be produced. So it's ideal for oil recovery. You still trap some oil in the pore space, you don't get everything out, um, but certainly the, the, this is very favorable. But do we see it in other circumstances? Yes. So I talked about electrolyzers and um, fuel cells. They have what, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's a gas diffusion there. Actually, the gas doesn't diffuse. Uh, the, the gas is, is basically pushed through um, this porous layer. So what it is, is carbon fibers. The carbon fibers conduct electricity. So the fibers themselves are conducting electricity because they make an electrical circuit. And then through the pore space of these fibers, and the porosity is very high, more than 50% typically, you want to have the movement of water and gas in opposite directions. Now, this wouldn't work. Carbon fibers are naturally water wet. They would just soak up water and the device would stop working. So what you do empirically is you coat, partially coat the fibers with PTFE, basically with plastic. And it sort of helps bind, it's a binder in the sense that it helps sticks the uh, fibers together. But what it does is you've now got a mixture of hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions. And you find that the menisci between the two, the, the water and the gas, then reside basically at the boundaries. And the overall curvature, so what's shown here is the water in the pore space, um, and there are different amounts of binder here, almost exactly give you zero curvatures. So this is ideal. What it means is the water and air continue to be connected through the pore space, and they can displace each other with essentially no capillary pressure. So when you're running the device, you don't have to build up a, a gas pressure to push the gas in, or you don't have to build up water pressure for it to escape, the two are moving essentially with no pressure difference between them. So this is ideal. What about three-phase flow? This is one of our specialities. Um, three-phase flow is important in a number of examples, but the principal one that we're interested in is CO2 storage into depleted uh, oil fields. So we want to store CO2 at scale, we can do it in uh, water deep underground. The problem there is we're not really sure what the geology is. And by placing the CO2 in the subsurface, you're going to increase the pressure because basically you're trying to force more material underground. So actually, the easiest thing to do is to take an oil field where you've taken the oil out. The pressure has gone down. You've got all the wells. You understand the infrastructure and you know for sure because oil has been there for millions of years, that you've got what's called a low, a cap rock, a low permeability layer, right? So the stuff isn't going to escape. So you've got three phase flow, oil, water, and gas. Now let's step back, think about the science. So when we got this, we've got actually three contact angles because we can have water and oil, water and gas, and oil and gas. So at this point, it becomes very complex because we sort of thought we've understood basically, you know, where there's one contact angle, but now we've got three. But it turns out there's a relationship between these three contact angles and the interfacial tensions. They're not independent. So I'm not expecting you in this brief uh, presentation to go through the maths, but these are the young equations. So for those of you who know this, this is basically a force balance, a, a horizontal force balance. And I write the three force balances and with a little bit of jiggling around, you can, um, sorry, with a bit of jiggling around, you can uh, get this relationship at the bottom between the three contact angles and the interfacial tensions. So what does that mean? And it has some interesting implications, um, basically why ducks don't get wet. Okay, so the first one is, if I have something that's water wet, if I have something that say is water wet in the presence of oil, then the presence of gas is also water wet, right? The surface likes water. So that's the sort of obvious one. So um, we just talked about that. So we've got here, okay, we've got a, a, an equation that basically gives us the K 
cosine of the gas water angle is one. The other thing is oil tends to spread on water. So the contact angle between gas and oil is close to zero. So that's not interesting. But now let's take the other case because I've been talking about things that are made out of plastic and plastic is made out of oil. So these are surfaces that are oil wet. What that means is that oil is the wetting phase in the presence of water. But what's the contact angle in the presence of gas? Because actually that's often the application. Well, if that's the case, you can go through the mathematics. If this contact angle is 180 degrees, so this cosine is minus one, this one is still plus one, but the oil water interfacial tension is greater than the gas oil. Typically at ambient conditions, oil water is about 50 millinewtons per meter, this is about 20. If we go deep underground, actually this may be lower, 25, but this will be much, much lower, maybe just one or two. Uh, millinewtons per meter. So an oil wet surface, something that's made of oil but likes oil, is hydrophobic. It repels water. So here's an example from my garden. Here's a droplet of water on a leaf. A leaf has a waxy surface. It actually wants to repel water. Otherwise, the plant dies. Basically, it needs to have gas exchange through the leaves. On the other hand, if you put olive oil on the leaf, it spreads out. So of course, why don't ducks get, why do ducks not get wet? They have oily feathers. They're always preening there. They've got an oil gland. They're preening their feathers. The feathers create a porous medium. It's saturated with air. It repels water. When they go into when they go into the, the, a pond, okay, you have to push the water in, right? They stay dry, and as a consequence, they stay warm. Okay. So what does that mean now in terms of CO two storage? So here's some dynamic imaging where we're injecting carbon dioxide from the top here. This is about four millimeters. OK, and we're taking images every 45 seconds. And this is an oil wet reservoir. So now what it means is that water is the most non-wetting phase. Oil is the wetting phase and CO2 is intermediate wet. It's neither in the biggest pores or in the smallest pores. So how does it progress? So in the video, the different colors are showing discrete ganglia of CO2. It's all trapped. So as it moves, what happens is CO2 displaces water that displaces oil, that can displace CO2, that can displace oil, that can displace CO2. You have these infinite chains of one phase displacing another, displacing another. And so the CO2 can migrate through the pore space, but as soon as I stop injecting, bam, all trapped. So this is actually very favorable for storage. It means I inject the CO2 and I stop injecting, certainly at the pore scale, it's not connected. Now, the reason why this is significant is most people understand oily, oily surfaces repel water. You know, the a varnished surface of your table, you've got a plastic jacket when it rains. That is everyone, except funnily enough, the people responsible for this. In petroleum engineering, axiomatically, in every equation that is used, for the design of CO2 storage, it is assumed that CO2 is the non-wetting phase, is always connected and flows very well. And so all our mathematical models are actually incorrect. So I know this sounds strange for the people who, who should know it best, but this is actually, it's not that non-obvious, but it is very significant when it comes to the design of CO2 storage in oil fields. And certainly in the US where there is a tax break now, for putting CO2 in the depleted oil field, um, this is a technology that is about to take off. Okay, what about, we're now gonna spend then maybe the next five minutes on some other applications, a bit more recent, in case you see some work that's just been published this year. Um, they're, they're more interesting things. So if we have gas in the subsurface, we see another process which is called Oswald ripening. So you might say, okay, so, so um, water comes in, you trap in the large pore spaces. But you have a process called Oswald ripening. And Oswald ripening is where you've got a bubble of gas here, and this is for hydrogen. There is hydrogen also dissolved in water. Not a lot, but there is some. How much is dissolved in water? Well, that depends on the solubility. And that's proportional to the gas pressure. But hang on, the gas pressure is the water pressure plus the capillary pressure. So if there's any differences in capillary pressure, there's slight differences in solubility. So for instance, if I got a little blob here with a high curvature, high pressure, high solubility. So in fact, dissolved material moves from the high curvature blobs to the low curvature blobs. And the tendency is basically for the larger ganglia 
to grow and some of the smaller ganglia to disappear. And so you see this in terms of volume, you see the emergence of one large connected ganglion. In terms of this Euler characteristic, right, this integral of the curvature, you actually see that go down. So what happens over time, and this the time scale is of order a day or so, you begin to see that the phases get better connected. And actually, that's good for storage. So you put, put it underground, you can get trapping, but then it can reconnect. So this is the theory. Um, again, I'm not going to go through all the details. I've right? got the reference here, um, but it is a nice little application of sort of some standard science. Use Henry's law to look at how much is dissolved. Um, you look at Fick's law to tell you how things move. Um, and of course, you've got young Laplace to give you some idea of changes in concentration. So you can find time scales for equilibria. Um, Oswald ripening in bulk, if you've got lots of bubbles, they all aggregate into one big bubble. That doesn't happen in a porous medium. Uh, there are multiple positions of equilibrium, but there is this tendency to reconnect the phases. So our working hypothesis is that we normally have extreme hysteresis between drainage, something going in and something going out with a lot of trapping. Uh, what we're suggesting is with this Oswald ripening, there's actually less hysteresis. So for instance, hydrogen storage is a little bit more favorable than you might think. There is still trapping. So the last thing I want to say, and again, very briefly, because I'm not going to have time to go through the details, but we do um, do a lot of modeling. So we create digital twins of the processes we're looking at. So, so what we do, shown on the, the left here, is, is what's called a poor network model. We create a topologically equivalent network and we solve for the flow processes through that. And the beautiful thing with our experiments is that we can match pore by pore. So we can sort of map this network onto the experiment and compare between experiment and the, the numerical model. And when we can do that, then we can predict macroscopic properties here showing relative permeability um, very nicely. We are extending it to uh, heat and mass transfer. So we're looking at heat transfer processes as well. So now we have a dual network. We're, we're, we're looking at um, heat transport, not just through the void space with fluid flow, but also through the solid. And here we can do so some simulations where we have a heated packed bed. And what happens is near the edges where it's heated, the viscosity of the water is lower. And so we get faster flow. Okay. And we're, we're working on that to design then reactors. So how do you put reactive components together where you're trying to understand the pore scale fluctuations in both the flow field and the temperature field? So there are lots of applications. Right? For those of you interested in surgical masks, if you look at a proper surgical mask, yeah, it's made out of plastic fibers, it repels water. Um, actually it is layered though, um, because the most dangerous are the really small droplets that can just fly through the mask and you can't make the mesh any finer because you need to breathe through it. So in fact, you have a, a combination of hydrophobic layers that trap big blobs and hydrophilic layers that basically the little blobs stick to, okay? Uh, fuel cells and electrolyzers, we've talked about this. Uh, carbon capture and storage, we've suggested that it's very favorable in depleted oil fields. And we're beginning to, to work on heat and ma mass flux. And our idea here is not only just to characterize what's going on, um, but actually to try and design efficient processes in porous media and to view this as a science and then reach out to the applications. So does it matter? Yes, there's a huge number of really, really significant uh, problems for this century that involve flow and porous media. And I'm gonna finish now um, by acknowledging sponsors. Um, we no longer do any research specifically related to oil and gas recovery, but we do still receive funding from the oil industry basically to work on the energy transition, mainly uh, CO2 and hydrogen storage. Um, I'd also like, I've got a textbook uh, that I've written, but doesn't really contain this more recent material, but certainly goes through some of the theory. And for those of you who want something even simpler, I do have a uh, YouTube channel where I try and explain some of the basic concepts that I've introduced today. So thank you very much for your time. And I do hope uh, we're gonna have some interesting questions. Thank you.